Okay. Here we go. Uh, you guys see any notices in your screen? No? Okay. All right. Uh, so that, basically, um, remember, uh, everything is being recorded, right? So that you can distribute it later. You can ask Frank. He'll send you the video profiles and the whole thing. So let's start uh, Let's start our conversation. First of all, good morning, the world. Good morning, Harasis. And good morning, all of our audiences around the world. And I want to welcome my panel to this exciting event that uh, Dr. took together. We have over 900 speakers. It's very exciting. Uh, we're almost living in a very different world today. Uh, we're going to be discussing everything today about how to deal with the new environment, new way of doing business in uh, in every practical field. So everything's changed. So first, uh, my great panel, I want to give you everybody about a 30 seconds, 45 seconds to introduce yourself to our global audiences. And let's start with the beautiful Miriam. Please speak about yourself and introduce yourself, please. Well, thank you, Henry. Uh, so I have been working uh, 15 years in turnaround and restructuring in the Middle East, um, America, uh, Europe. Um, I am now the owner of a firm uh, that assists companies in their uh, restructuring and hard times, basically. We are a team of uh, diversified experts that live across the world. Um, we help mainly private equity firms or SMEs um, go through trouble times, but through these. Um, we today are sector agnostic, basically we work with every sector, and we have a lot of work these days. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here. Let's go to India. Khalid, please introduce us, tell us what you do, and welcome to Horasis. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm the Executive Director for Central Global and Strategic Studies, and uh, I practically have uh, almost now uh, 30 years of working. Uh, initially, I was in the military. I uh, retired as a colonel. I was uh, uh, for around 23, 24 years. I was in the military, and uh, during my service in military, I uh, uh, was in the United Nations and in many other assignments abroad. And since last five years. I'm the executive director for Center for Global and Strategic Studies. Uh, Center for Global and Strategic Studies is a think tank in Pakistan, and uh, it basically works on the track to diplomacy. It works on the business to business collaborations. We work with the government of Pakistan, and uh, we represent uh, various business houses. Uh, and we uh, we are also working very closely with uh, 52 uh, countries around the world. We have. Uh, collaborations and uh, plus uh, we also represent uh, uh, China in the Belt and Road Forum. Uh, we, uh, we work uh, for China in the Belt and Road Network in almost 71 countries. Well, Holly, thank you. Welcome thank you. Pakistan to Harassis. It's great. We hope to have Harassis one day in Pakistan with you leading the charge. So now let's go to Japan. Toshi, great to see you and welcome to Harassis. Please introduce yourself. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Because you know, I can barely hear you guys so far. Yeah, we can hear you well. Is, you can hear me. Okay, then I'll speak myself. Okay. So, um, my name is Tochimoto, uh, I mean Katsuyuki Tochimoto. Uh, first of all, I'm very pleased to be here. I mean, not in Tokyo, I mean on this, you know, internet. And um, I'm a strategy consultant uh, for companies to develop, uh, uh, sorry, for helping uh, develop uh, their corporate strategies. And I'm running my own firm, uh, own consulting firm called MCRE and for 17 years. And I've been in this field uh, for over 30 years, including Boston Consulting Group, Bain & Company, and Monitor Group. And I've been looking forward uh, to exchanging views with you here. Thank you. Excellent. 
Well, thank you. And uh, everybody, I know this is your first time with Karasis, and I want to welcome you all uh, to this great panel. And today we have a critical subject to discuss. Uh, that subject matter is future-proofing of business. And this is critical in, uh, in an environment that's extremely unpredictable now, unprecedented uh, in our history. Uh, and uh, obviously the key to success is being able to adapt and adapt very quickly different circumstances that are being thrown at you. So what I want to do right now is basically, first of all, to all of our audience, if you guys have questions that are listening around the world, please put them into the chat and we'll address them at the end of the, our conversation. So I'm going to start with Pakistan, uh, obviously, and we want to, Khalid, we want to talk to you about one critical aspect. I want to start with you, obviously, you are in a position that you see a lot of information from around the world, from very different companies, you understand how different entities and different industries are handling crisis now, and what is your, you know, initial steps of how to go from day to day business that we knew seven months ago, eight months ago, nine months ago now, right? Uh, and now, how do we look in the future? How do we actually proofing our business to make sure we're successful long term? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, before. Uh, Coming over to the topic, I would just like to take all of you to uh, 1918 to 1923. Actually, this pandemic is not a new thing for the world, and I would say that uh, 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 every hundred years the world has seen such kind of uh, pandemics or such kind of diseases uh, which had uh, uh, practically affected the lives of the people. But if we see uh, where we were in 1923, once the pandemic finished, so it took four years uh, once that Spanish flu uh, finished, and, uh, and I'm sure that at that point in time, people like us who were uh, alive at that point in time, they must have thought that now everything is stopped and the world is stopped uh, advancing. But after 1923, we saw. Uh, the era of, uh, till now, in the last hundred years, we saw the era of globalization and we saw uh, these televisions on which we are talking right now, we saw everything uh, which uh, came up after 1923. So, we should not be pessimistic in this sense that uh, uh, the world has stopped, it has not stopped. Yes. After this COVID, there will be uh, lots of uh, uh, things which would change the, uh, the way we interact, the way we used to go for tourism. Uh, maybe for some point in time, the things will change, but the world will go on. Uh, now coming over uh, to uh, the topic about the future proofing the business. Uh, I would divide my talk into basically three uh, segments. The first one uh, the, is the isolation. Uh, what, uh, uh, and the second is the uh, effects on the mental health. Uh, and third is the lack of connectivity, which is between the employees and the employer and the employees within themselves. So as we know that uh, uh, in February onwards, uh, this pandemic uh, uh, resulted virtually in the lockdown of uh, almost complete world and uh, uh, everybody was at home uh, and all the businesses which were uh, which used to thrive uh, because of the manpower, especially sales, marketing and uh, manufacturing industry, they badly suffered due to uh, this uh, pandemic, including aviation industry, oil industry, everything uh, uh, got affected. But again, uh, then we saw that after a lapse of five to ten days, practically uh, the company they started off their uh, businesses again uh, through online meetings, through Zoom, through uh, Google networks, through Microsoft networks and other networks. So, uh, but uh, how the business came back uh, during the COVID period in the first world is very different than the business coming back in the third world. As I'm from Pakistan, I won't say that 
we are third world country, but I would say we are in between first world and third world because uh, uh, in the last uh, two decades we have uh, improved a lot our internet connectivity, we have uh, worked a lot on our human resource. Now almost uh, everybody who is graduating uh, is uh, computer literate and uh, uh, has practically uh, owns uh, a laptop. So, what has to be done? Number one, the effects of isolation. As we have seen that uh, uh, the generation which whom I am working at least with uh, is the generation of uh, the, the new generation of high tech generation. They were already using uh, laptops. They were already using uh, high tech electronic gadgetry. So for them, adopting to the new normal of uh, uh, this uh, post pandemic or during pandemic season was not a problem. But people like us who had been, uh, who practically believed that uh, if you have to work, you have to practically in the morning go to the office and then you have to work, we face lots of problems. Uh, I would just give you an example of my younger son, he's eight years of age and uh, Practically, he was the one who taught me how to use Zoom. So, uh, as I said, that for them, uh, switching over to the classes, switching over to uh, the uh, to everything on uh, electronic gadgetries was just a normal thing because they were already on the Facebook all day. But uh, people like us, we faced a lot of problems. As I said, that uh, I worked uh, for almost. Uh, 10 days, 10 to 15 days with my staff on uh, the internet, on, on the Zoom and uh, online. But then after 15 days, I was literally cut up. I said, okay, everybody come to office and let's see either the COVID kills us or we kill COVID. We kill COVID. So then uh, uh, after 15 days, 15, 16, first 15, 16 days of lockdown, we practically started back with the office because uh, there were lots of coordination things, there were lots of things which you could not do sitting at home. Uh, similarly, uh, as I said, uh, I will uh, talk about my country more because uh, we have got a lot of people who are living below the uh, poverty line and they have to go out at work. So if the business would shift over uh, to uh, the electronic agencies, then a lot of human resource will go waste. So, uh, in times to come, if we have to uh, find ways of new normal, then what we, we do with uh, the human resource, uh, it means half of the world population will sit at home. Uh, so, we have to think about them also. Okay. Uh, Holy, thank you so much. Uh, I will come back to you with Muldiv, but I want to stress what you mentioned. Uh, the pandemic, the uh, in the Spanish flu, right? 1923, we were not as globally connected economically as we are now, uh, and obviously it's a very uh, the uh, pandemic is pandemic. And yes, it happens all the time in different matters. But today, the difference, in my opinion, is how well we are connected and how the supply chains around the world, depending on the other, to produce anything in Pakistan, U.S. or Ukraine, for that matter. So uh, obviously the human resource factor is critical now. We have to make adoption to how we treat our human resource, how we educate our human resource, and how we are basically changing the way we do things. So now we're going to Miriam, and Miriam, one of the things you want to discuss with us is, uh, you know, how to, what's the right way uh, for companies to weather the crisis such as this one? And the next question I have for you, which is a follow-up, is the company, you know, what is the rule the company should apply to minimize unforeseen crisis, uh, not just now, but in the future? Because we anticipate things of this nature will happen all the time. So, Miriam, to you, please give us your opinion. Well, you are right. Things will happen. And as you said, you know, in the history of, uh, of the world, there have been so many crises and we've all overcome them. Um, it's been hard. And this one is going to be hard. I don't know if you've, I mean, the numbers say from anything between, I mean, worldwide, 2.5 to 5% recession. Some countries, even 50% recession, which is uh, huge. 
Um, but I would say that every situation is specific to every company. So I'm just going to start by saying that there, there are no really rule. But if I were to give uh, two major uh, criteria to consider, um, I think it would be, first of all, cash. Okay. So what, how much cash do you have? Uh, what's your financial situation? How long can you use that cash? Uh, how much cash are you burning every day? Um, and then which industry are you in? What are the prospects of your industry? Um, so, for example, you know, we've, ha we've seen industries that have collapsed, uh, mm -hmm. the airline industry, uh, you know, and everything adjacent to those airline industries, like, you know, uh, fuel, uh, hotels, uh, car rentals, etc. A lot of liquidation. The spillover effect, as we call it. Sorry? The spillover effect, as we call exactly. it, right? Exactly, exactly. But we've also seen industries that have had skyrocketed, like, you know, Zoom, for example, obviously everybody knows about that. Netflix, you know, online wellness. Um, now you can do psychotherapy online, which is great. Um, so I think that when, I, when we talk about this sector, the idea is to say, and in a very realistic way, where am I today? Where is my sector going? Can I go back to that growth? Um, where was I before COVID? Okay. Uh, if you were if you were on a declining, you know, um, uh, rate before COVID, you know, you need to take a hard look at your business, and that's also really very complicated to do when you're a CEO because you know you're in a day to day. You're looking at an operation. You're looking at this crisis, and you're trying to figure out ways to survive today. But it's important to have that outlook, you know, for the future, to look at where you are. So we've seen, for example, a lot of businesses repurpose themselves. Like, for example, I've worked with a company that uh, creates, that produces parts for aircrafts and that mm -hmm. has repurposed uh, to create ventilators. Okay. So it's very important to look at that in that way and try to be uh, creative and see you know, if you can be part of the new way and the new sectors and because there is a new way now. There, yes. there is definitely like, even if the air, if, even if the airline industry comes back, it's, it's going to take some time. They're going to have like, there's a 10 year, there's a 10 year now gap for them, for, for them to come back. So that, that's, uh, I would say, so cash and prospects. Um, and when looking at that, I think it's very important for, for, um, leaders and CEOs to be very realistic and, you know, obviously nobody wants to do that, but sometimes you just need to take the right decision and say, okay, I'm going to take my losses today because you have a responsibility towards your employees, you know, and, um, rather than stringing them along for month and month and month for something that's not going to go anywhere, it's better to say, okay, you know, there is no way this is going to go further. But if there is, you know, go back to your investors, go back to your financers, and and instead of uh, financing something that is not going to go really anywhere, um, yep. try to finance repurposing and a new strategy for your business. So, uh, Miriam, the, obviously one of the key messages that you're giving is that communication is critical now. Uh, it's critical to communicate with your, uh, not only your employees, but your, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your ecosystem. Make sure your, uh, Khalid, can you mute your phone, please? I mean, can you mute yourself? There's a background noise, Khalid, on your side. Can you just mute your uh, for a second, Khalid? <coughs> so, Miriam, the key message that you're presenting to us the key, the key is basically making adoption and communicating all the time. I can hear you very well. Yes. Khalid, uh, can you mute yourself? One second. Khalid, can you mute yourself? There was some problem and uh, there was some problem with our laptop there. Uh, okay, can you, uh, Khalid, can you mute yourself? You have a background noise, please. For a second. 
Well, Miriam, your message, and apologies to everybody, Miriam, your message was communication is the key, adoption is the key, making sure that you're looking at the future, not the past. Is that correct? Am I summarizing correctly? Yeah, and be realistic. And be realistic. That's, that's the key. So one of the things is obviously being realistic is very difficult in this environment. Uh, so, and one of the key issues here, what is reality today? You know, so, uh, Tosh, I'm going to you with a question. And one of the things you talked about uh, that we discussed before is basically you, we see a whole level of new uncertainties. So what is real today? How do we make projections go forward? And what are we developing? How do we develop our portfolio activity uh, going forward because of uncertainties and maybe a spoke one? And how to be realistic would be question. Okay, um, again, uh, that was for me, right? Yes, I, 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 could, I, I can barely hear you again because of connection or something. Um, so, uh, let me say, um, maybe this may be a little bit, uh, indirect view from the purpose of this session, but I think before considering, uh, how the strategy reformulation, uh, can be done in the new, you know, circumstance, uh, I want to think about what strategy reformulation should be in the corona era first. Okay. Uh, this in a pandemic is drastically raising the level of uncertainties in the business. And everybody says now the remote work, uh, will be standard or less and less people, uh, work at the offices or delivery food will be more common. Uh, the value chain will become more closed one than before, et cetera, et cetera. But, Nobody can tell how much extent such trends will go on or when people uh, stop wearing masks. Uh, nobody can tell that. So for dealing with extremely high uncertainties like this in the business, I am proposing my clients uh, to develop a new framework for their business portfolio. Uh, in addition to classic type of business portfolio, which consists of uh, you know, market attractiveness versus, uh, relative strengths against competitors. Companies should add other perspectives, such as how diversified a business, uh, model or value chain, uh, they have and how much they bet on unknown potential market as well, rather than just betting on less risky, obviously growing market from everyone's perspective. So then wh what is a diversified business model? Uh, for example, a restaurant chain should not stay in restaurant business fields only anymore, uh, but they might have to seek for developing open delivery station infrastructure for various players to get the profit pool uh, from the total value chain. Or for manufacturers, uh, they should stream down to directly, uh, sell their products with, you know, D2C, uh, direct to customer concept. Or, you know, a lot of guys, uh, should seek for becoming kind of, you know, platform player, uh, gathering or utilizing accumulated data. So then what is unknown potential market? Um, uh, well, I stop here. Uh, my explanation so far is uh, already uh, complicated enough, I think. Um, but uh, is the current level of remote work infrastructure enough to sustain such very complicated discussion? Or is it sophisticated enough for conveying all of these thoughts? My answer uh, is no. So. I want to say at least for high level strategy, uh, formulation or reformulations, people need more sophisticated way. I mean, more, you know, understandable, you know, circumstance or what, you know, other people think, uh, watching, you know, their face or something. So I believe, uh, for example, virtual reality technologies with almost real visual impression and real sounds, uh, like in the, conference room settings will be needed to suffice the need for high level uh, strategy development. That's one aspect, I think. Uh, I mean, this, you know, current situation is, uh, has a kind of you know, negative 
uh, impact for uh, promoting innovation on entrepreneurship uh, in the business. But I actually have another aspect. I have observed uh, other aspects as well. So I want to talk about that uh, in addition to that. Um, I'd happened to conduct survey and interviews about a year before pandemic uh, on whether or not uh, remote work uh, would be major trend in the business in Tokyo. And at that point of time, even a kind of you know evangelist type of guys um, promoting remote work with IT technologies uh, denied the trend in the near future. Uh, so for these you know basic behaviors or customs, Japanese people usually never change their way. It takes very, very long time to change. And believe it or not, our government, I mean, Japanese government, uh, still uses fax rather than email. <laughs> In Ukraine, that's true. Yeah. But <laughs> this pandemic was different in a sense. Uh, in Japan, uh, you meet someone first uh, in the business settings. You are supposed to exchange business cards. Right. So, uh, with Toshi, deep I want to bar stop like this. Here. Toshi, I want to stop when you right here. We, uh, when, you know, we started remote meeting, we had some trouble because we cannot exchange business cards anymore on the net. Yes. And it, we also could not bow deeply enough because, you know, you'd bump, you know, you, your head would bump into the table in the ordinary, you know, remote work settings. So, um, but this can bring a new way of meeting in a sense, so I would say, uh, which can lead to less formal and less authoritative and more casual way of talks. So it is a kind of uh, unexpected byproduct uh, brought by the pandemic and maybe bright aspect, uh, which can lead to open discussion or flat organization, and eventually uh, somewhat innovation. Toshi, yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to share here. No, no. It was great. Thank you very much. And you brought a great points, especially... I can't to hear you now. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, Toshi. So what, I want to go back uh, to what you just said. And uh, it, it's great that we have good people from different parts of the world. This is what's beautiful about harasses. Cultural issues are critical. And when I'm talking to my kids now uh, in, the, in college in America, it's a very different world they're living on. So one of the things you have said, obviously right now what's going to happen is our planning, strategy planning for business, the cycles are much shorter now. We have to be shorter. We cannot plan three, five years. We can have an idea where we're going, but also it's going to be very difficult to actually have a real plan because Things change so fast. So I want to go now to Miriam, back to you, and then we'll get to Khalid and basically discuss how the planning, strategic planning, has to adapt, meaning that we have to have shorter cycles of different events and different milestones before we can continue to go. So maybe we have a big goal, but now we have to change really weekly, maybe monthly, of adapting to whatever circumstances are thrown at us. Miriam, please, you. No, exactly. I think it's... Um, you know, we've done the business plans and we've worked on business plans and blah, blah, blah. And honestly, I've seen maybe 10% of business plans work. Right. Uh, <laughs> this is before COVID. Yes. Okay. So I think, yeah, COVID has brought to light that, yes, you know, you need to have, as you said, a clear picture of where you're going. You need to innovate, you know, as um, was said also before. And, but most of all, you need to stay agile. So, you know, you need to make sure you're always on a diet. You know, you're, a company is like a human being. It always needs to be on a diet. I know it's hard, but you always need to make sure you have enough cash in order to, you know, see what's going to happen and, and um, make sure that you can pay the salaries if you don't have any income, etc. But you also need to make sure that you keep your, your costs down all the time and your fixed cost to the lowest level possible. Yes, so if I need to change, 
The yeah. fixed cost is what kills us usually, right? As yes, exactly. And I think also, you know, you need to find another way to work with employees to give them maybe more flexibility because people now are more into, you know, understanding what they really want and spend more time with their children at home, etc. So try to find some kind of more flexible contract with your employees. And I'm, I'm putting them in the fixed cost, obviously. But keep your fixed cost very, very low and always be at the lookout of what's happening in the industry. Where, where should I go? You know, um, as Yushi was saying, yes, you need to diversify. You need to make sure that you are looking at different trends and you are trying to invest in, in new things and whatever is happening. And if you're a supermarket, well, up. Let's move to delivery. You know, right, right. that's that's what's happening now, and that's how you survive. And so, stop your five-year plan. That's over. Right. So, Miriam, thank you very much. So, Khalid, we back to you, back to Pakistan. And one thing that uh, two things that Miriam uh, 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 Miriam has uh, brought up is too critical. First of all, quick agility. Right? We have to be agile in order to do this. But I want to stress with you two questions that I have for you on that part. How are we being agile with our fixed costs, which also includes many times, number one, loans we go from the banking, financial side of things, where we get a loan, right? So how does the financing of business will change? And it will change. We also have blockchain and cryptocurrency coming as a financial instruments. And second is, how do you minimize your labor costs? Because now they're pretty much both demanding, the employees demand the flexibility, and employers, businesses, do not want to have a major payroll in case of crisis and then letting people down. So what do you think of how the business should adapt on those two factors? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, uh, this is a fact that uh, uh, this pandemic has taught almost every business that how to work with a reduced staff. Now everybody uh, is looking for uh, multitasker people that you have less people who can do more. This is a fact. But at the same time, uh, at least what we have seen in this part of the world that uh, this pandemic period has produced more new entrepreneurs. So now the uh, size of the business uh, is going to go, uh, it, the pie will be divided into many people. Like if, uh, if one person was having one business and uh, uh, had employed 80 people now, uh, those 80 people will be divided among 10 businesses because uh, uh, at least in this part of the world we have seen in the last 4-5 months we have seen a mushroom, a mushroom growth of uh, the small and uh, medium business entrepreneurs. All those people who had experiences, uh, who had uh, uh, they have pulled up their money or did something and instead of going back to their jobs, they are now looking to start their own business, whether it be uh, uh, very small, but uh, now people uh, are uh, so they are so scared that uh, this kind of pandemic or some kind of natural disaster in future also will have uh, them, uh, uh, will get their jobs lost. So instead of uh, going back to the jobs, they are looking for uh, to start their own business. This is one. Two, uh, uh, what we have seen that, uh, as you said, that the pandemic has, uh, and our speaker from Japan has said that, like, uh, we also use facts. You are not the only one using facts. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so uh, the cost of human resource has gone very down. You know, previously, if somebody has done master's or PhD, he would uh, ask for a lot of money to, from the employer. But uh, in pandemic, we have seen that the cost of human resource has gone down. And uh, as the cost has gone down, uh, but the costs of the production cost and other costs, uh, they have gone up, but human resource uh, cost has gone down. The cost of production has gone up because uh, we have seen that uh, the concept of globalization has miserably failed during this uh, pandemic. There is no globalization because we uh, eventually we went back to old age where uh, people used to stick to their countries and people used to uh, produce whatever uh, raw material is available in their country. But in the concept of globalization, we can get something from Japan and assemble it over here. 
So uh, the countries and uh, the businesses have realized that in times to come, uh, for getting ready uh, for a new pandemic or few for a new natural disaster, it is uh, worth that if we have the uh, production material uh, made in our own countries, uh, so that in case of lockdown or in case of some kind of disconnectivity, uh, we can make everything in our own country. So this is the second which uh, people have learned and uh, which they are adopting. So uh, the major shift uh, in the post-pandemic period will be shifting from globalization to regionalism. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a very valid point. And Toshi, back to Japan. One of the things Khalid brought up is uh, we're now going to a very entrepreneurial economy where individuals uh, such as my, I mean, the 20-year-olds, right, will be much more likely to start their own business, create their own cryptocurrency that can be valued by individuals or anybody else. And so obviously labor force will change dramatically. Uh, as Khalid pointed out, the labor force will cost less if you're hiring them, uh, but they also have less work to do. So the question to you is, uh, how do you think the entrepreneurial component uh, within the existing businesses and the new generation coming would be a change due to this you know, changing environment the daily? Toshi, to you. Hmm. Um... You want to uh, think about that uh, in the context of a pandemic or just... I think in a context, the pandemic have changed our appreciation of our employees. Mm-hmm. What I mm-hmm. mean by that, we have to be, as a business, we have to be very, as Miriam pointed out, we have to be very mm-hmm. on the diet. I'm always having a hard time with that. But yes, we have to be on a really thin diet. We have to be very flexible with the amount of our mm-hmm. labor force we bring in. Therefore... Mm-hmm. As a result, a lot of employees who are currently or previously been employees now would be looking to make a living doing something on their own. Due to technology, Mm -hmm. a great deal of opportunities which will be created through the technology for many Mm -hmm. individuals to become entrepreneurs. So my question Mm -hmm. to you was, how do you see the labor force changing uh, in this post-pandemic world? Hopefully it will be soon. Okay, it's a tough question. (laughs) That's why I'm here. Um, yeah, um, I think there are various directions. I mean, for example, younger generation uh, can work simultaneously at different places uh, in this, you know, situation. Cause you know, your boss sometimes don't know, you know, no, no, what but... you know, younger guys you know do. So um, such kind of you know uh, relaxing their mind. Uh, from sticking to one company in lifetime employment system can be changed into, okay, we can try some other things and we can try that, uh, a little bit safely as long as, for example, if you work for a big company, uh, but e- even if, you know, you should, uh, remote work, remote work. Uh, right. but, you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, uh, they become a kind of you know, specialist on, you know, soap opera in the daytime because, you know, they just pretend to work, uh, in front of, you know, PC, but they actually watch TV, you know, you know, that kind of you know, relaxation, uh, can bring some, you know, freedom to think well, about in you know, the other things. You brought up a great yeah. point because you see now, we see people already, first of all, what happened 20 years ago where you had a, 30 years ago, where you have a job for life, it no longer exists before the pandemic. So now your great suggestion that most likely most of the young people will be simultaneously working for themselves, for the company, right. and maybe doing something else. But Miriam, mm-hmm. I want to. He also brought a very critical question of control and the culture. Obviously, there now individuals have to be self motivated and not being, so to speak, run around by the boss. So, how does the culture? What do we have to adapt as the business owners? How do we adapt our culture? And please keep it to a minute. I think control is over. Yes. I mean, it's done. <laughs> Halas, you need to. This, uh, that was this, under a minute for sure. It's under a minute. You need to forget about that. First of all, the new generation that is coming up that, that cannot be, there is no control over them. It's impossible. It's attention, it's attention deficit disorder issue, right? When it does. 
<laughs> I think I think they have new values. You know, I think uh, they have the value of uh, wanting to work in what they love and what they like doing. I think um, there's a whole tendency of uh, material material uh, things are not that important, and you know. Anyway, uh, I'm making a small generalization here, but definitely what we see in the companies we work with is the younger generation is over control, okay? Oh, yes, and, yeah. the, and the current one is now realizing with this whole like six months we've had through COVID that, oh, I can work from home and it's pretty cool. And yeah. I can do as much work. I don't have to spend eight hours a day at the office. Obviously, there are, there is work that cannot be done. I mean, if you work in a factory... It has to be, you know, but another thing just, and I'm just going to finish with this is uh, employers have to be more conscious, you know, like the, the old model of working eight hours a day in a factory, etc. that has to be over. There has to be another way of working with people, of making sure that, you know, they're uh, growing with you, with the company. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. Halita, to you. Uh, and uh, the question I wanted to ask you is this. Obviously, as uh, different cultures, uh, the, the Toshi brought up uh, cultures, for example, uh, in uh, obviously, as you see the new generation come up and demanding the freedom, uh, culture also plays a role, right? The country culture, the ethnic culture, where, you know, uh, you have to, all elderly, all the people, almost telling the younger what to do. So how do you deal with this? And please keep it up there a minute. Uh, about culture, I would say the new generation has got no culture because one day they see a Turkish drama and they adopt the Turkish culture and another day they uh, see a... Uh, Russian fashion show and they, were, they, were, they want to wear the same clothes as uh, the Russians are wearing. So practically uh, we are, uh, the social media has drifted away from the culture and uh, now uh, the new norm is that uh, whatever you feel like you wear and whatever culture you want to follow, you follow. Uh, not like all of us who are sitting over here that uh, we would value our culture and we would value our language. Uh, so uh, in our part, like people want to learn Chinese more and more, and uh, uh, maybe in another ten years, uh, you will find uh, uh, after the cross marriages of Asians and Chinese, you will find Chinese all around. So uh, it's uh, the word culture is, I would say, uh, is getting less and less uh, in the new world and in the new norm. Okay, thank you. Well, one of the things we understand that people of, uh, let's call it 40 years and, uh, forty years old and up, we're going to have a much harder time changing than the younger people, obviously, right? Because we're already stuck in our ways. So, first of all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a fascinating uh, experience. And what I'd like to do now, starting with our uh, Toshi in Japan, is to, for 15, 20 seconds, final words uh, before we wrap it up uh, for the, uh, for the uh, our, our panel. So, Toshi, to you, final words how, and this is question to all, how we do after the pandemic is over? Okay, uh, pandemic is very bad thing, of course. You know, many people, people died. But at the same time, uh, you know, all the people in the world on this planet share the same experience uh, for the same direction. So even though there are many, you know, different culture, but... Um, we should take advantage of this experience. This will be a world history. And uh, once we overcome, uh, that will be recorded as, you know, good compliment, you know, about the human being. Thank you, Miriam. To you. Sorry, I'm on you. Um, after the pandemic, uh, well, you know, we live. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm under living right now. But I, uh, it's going to be a great, like, it's going to be a new world for the best, I hope. Okay, thank you. And now to Pakistan, Halid. Yeah, I agree with Mariam that after the pandemic, the world will move on. The world will move on with the new norms and uh, uh, with a new spirit. And uh, hopefully we'll see many new things. Maybe uh, next time uh, and some devices uh, invented that we that could transfer uh, you from Ukraine to Pakistan via this video link. 
Oh, thank you. So, but my final words are the following. What I believe is going to happen, in my view, that the new, that every crisis in history presents a great deal of opportunity as well. So in our case, what we're looking for, we see a great deal of opportunity and we want to change the world. So thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it, you guys, and enjoy your day. Enjoy the rest of the harasses. Thank you very, very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.